Hey guys, it's Danny. Welcome to another live stream. Today we are focusing only on Phalaenopsis orchids and I know some of you are going to be very excited about this. I am too because recently I just happened to rediscover my love for Phalaenopsis which I lost a few years ago somehow. Even flower shop Phalaenopsis. So today we're going to talk a little bit about them, a few thoughts that I have on them, we're not going to make tutorials because this stream will never end, but I do have linked below in the description of this stream a full series only on Phalaenopsis orchids. So if you're a beginner and you want to learn a lot about them, do check out the description after the stream. Today though, I want to focus mainly on your questions. So you can ask me anything about care, about whatever you feel like regarding Phalaenopsis, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about my thoughts on them this year about the flower shop phalaenopsis and also the special ones where can we get them how do they look like why are they special and all of these things but before we get into the subject i just want to say hello to you guys so i see so many of you already hi boril hi trish hi john thomas oh happy easter you guys if you're celebrating easter today I wish you happy holidays. I hope you will enjoy it. It's not Easter here yet. I think it's next week. So, yeah. Ronald, Brita, Danka, Jenny, hi, how are you guys? Hope you're all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Um, Diana, John, everybody, thank you guys so much for joining. As a little side note, this is not pre-recorded. Thank you for the compliment though. <laughs> this is all live. So I'm glad you all could make it. So with that said, let's get into the subject. Let's talk a little bit about these beautiful orchids that managed to captivate our hearts because I'm sure that for most of you, this will be the very first orchid you have, if not for all of you. It was the very first orchid I ever had for me as well. And, well, the passion for it kind of subsided throughout the years because in the flower shops, as you might know, we mainly find the white ones, pink, purple, and that's about it. However, it just seems to me that in the past few years, there have been quite a few hybrids, new hybrids developed. And also, there have been quite a few miniature phalaenopsis that I didn't know of. So, it goes without saying, I just had to have some of these. This is one of them. This orchid I've never seen before. It's a flower shop phalaenopsis. I don't have an ID for it, sadly, but I did find it at the flower shop. And not only this one, as you might have seen in the thumbnail, I do have quite a beautiful phalaenopsis. Let me grab it. This one over here. Now, again, I don't actually have an ID for it but just look how beautiful it is and you can find this in flower shops now more than seven years ago maybe nine years ago at this point in flower shops you would go and see the white pink purple and that's it well my dears in the past few years i actually found in the flower shop can you take a guess the Phalaenopsis Leodoro. Oh yes, I saw it for the first time for sale this year. It was advertised as a fragrant orchid. It was expensive compared to the other Phalaenopsis, but at least it was available in flower shops. So I do think that recently, manuf not manufacturers, orchid nurseries, mass production nurseries are starting to go a little bit away from the typical Phalaenopsis and I are trying to get into more hybrids, which is great isn't it? But these big phalaenopsis are not the only ones in flower shops and at very decent prices. As you guys might know, recently I did get into quite the tiny phalaenopsis. So here is one of them. This is called a multiflora. It is a special type of hybrid, if you will. It has been created specifically for flower shops for purchasing by average people, not necessarily by orchid enthusiasts. And it has been created to create this wonderful display of flowers. It creates a lot of blooms at the same time, branches and all of those fun stuff, which is not the only one. We have here a yellow one, ta-da. 
Well, with this much diversity, who can say no, right? Well, this being said, I have to say that I think I will part ways with many of my big Phalaenopsis orchids, which we're gonna see. I will keep a few of them because some are indeed special. Not only did they work on colors and patterns and things of the sorts, but also the shape. You guys might know the big lip Phalaenopsis. We're gonna get to it. I have a big lip Phalaenopsis in bloom right now. So beautiful. But surprise, surprise. This year, they also came up with a miniature Phalaenopsis with a big lip. You'll have to excuse mine. It's been in bloom for a lot of time. This has been sent to me by lovely Veronica, but look at that. It is the first ever big lip Phalaenopsis that I ever saw in flower shops. So of course, with this much variety, I do believe Phalaenopsis are starting to make a comeback in our lives. Yes, of course, people will always buy Phalaenopsis, but for us, which are true orchid passionates and collectors, I do believe the spark kind of died off throughout the years. Am I wrong? So you should let me know, how do you feel about Phalaenopsis at this point? How much experience do you have when you started with Phalaenopsis? Um, how did you transition to other orchids? And now would you go back to Phalaenopsis? Would you invest, let's say, space into collecting Phalaenopsis? What are your thoughts? I want to hear. Pineapples, you have a question? Please do let us know your question and I will try to answer it. Marcel, you don't have a big lip Phalaenopsis? Well, that's the thing. They're not all that common when it comes to diversity at this point, but trust me, they will become very, very frequent in flower shops. I first heard about the big lip Phalaenopsis many years ago. Never thought I would find it in shops, but here we are. <laughs> Jack Russell, it's all you have. That's perfect. I was surprised to see that I actually have about 70 Phalaenopsis at this point. Can you believe it? You can definitely create a beautiful collection out of them. Brita, you don't really see many mini Phalaenopsis in nurseries. That is absolutely true. In nurseries, you most pro probably will not find these things. You will go for polychylus, novelty types. Mini Phals are flower shops. So that's a good thing, right? Because they're very easy to find. Lucy, I love them all as well. Hi, Jack. Glad you could make it. You're a little late, though. <laughs> Joes, we will talk about Miltoniopsis at a different time. I do have problems with Miltoniopsis as well, but let's just stick to Phalaenopsis right now. How can I make cakeys? Well, Rolando, it's a little bit difficult. Phalaenopsis orchids usually create cakeys on their own. If they so desire, they can create a spite cakey or a basil cakey. It happens naturally. It's, it doesn't mean anything. But in order to induce a cakey, you can actually use a uh, cakey paste, we call it a cakey paste. It is a product that contains plant hormones. And if you apply it to one note, you can actually obtain a cakey. I will have a video this year. I'm working on the project off camera. So multiplying Phalaenopsis, not so easy, sadly. Victoria, I'm glad to hear your Phalaenopsis are doing great in semi-hydro. Mine have done pretty okay in semi-hydro as well. I just had a lot of issues in the summertime. I have a very, very dry, dry, hot climate. SL, yes, LED strips designed for aquariums will definitely work as supplemental light. And when you say LED strips, I think you mean the proper aquarium lamp. If that's what you mean, definitely will work. I believe aquarium lamps are top of the line, pretty much. The good brands, there's no reason why they shouldn't do okay. Diego cast, well, you are going to see my single. Actually, I'm going to show it right now because I do want to talk a little bit about the single. So if you don't know what the single is, well, it's a Phalaenopsis, which is sold as the Phalaenopsis with one single flower. It will appear in the shot, don't worry. Here's my single. And well, my problem with this orchid was that it was advertised as something it was not. 
my phalaenopsis you can see looks like a typical phalaenopsis but when i purchased it it had very 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 tiny leaves and this i believe was caused by stunting hormones so pretty much what they were selling was a very very tiny orchid the size of a miniature phalaenopsis it was the size of this if you can believe it with one stem up to here high and one single flower so of course when i saw it in flower shops i thought ooh that's a Paphiopetalum that looks like a Phalaenopsis, but actually it was a Phalaenopsis with its flower spike cut. And I purchased it because I thought it was a good deal. I thought it was a big flowered Phalaenopsis and that's exactly what it was. Here she is two years later, looking like a normal Phalaenopsis, like how it should look like having beautiful large white flowers. So yeah, I think this is what's going to happen with all single O's that you see on the market. I don't have a problem with them per se. It is a marketing thing, um, but I do hope they make it more clear that this is just a typical Phalaenopsis, not something different. But yeah, that's my single O Phalaenopsis. I really, really love it. Hi, Sue. Thank you so much for being my supporter. Hi Larissa, hi Lucy, glad you guys could make it. Pineapples, uh, yep, we're gonna talk about cherry babies and oncidiums at a later date. Alrighty guys, so another thing that I'm getting into this year are the special Phalaenopsis and I do wanna show you this one because sadly it's the only flower that I have so far. So this is the Asconopsis irendopkin. This is a, hmm, it's a, it's a complex hybrid, it's an intergeneric hybrid between an Ascocentrum and a Phalaenopsis. If you didn't know Vandas and Phalaenopsis are compatible, yes they are. And this is one of the most coveted of these, let's say, really novel hybrids. Mine is pretty new in my collection and it had a lot of buds, but thrips got to it. However, though, I still managed to save a flower and I wanted to show it to you guys because it's so, so beautiful. So apart from all of the Phalaenopsis that we can find, we can also have the intergeneric hybrids, which is absolutely amazing because it opens the door to a lot, a lot of hybrids. <laughs> Pineapples, you can talk to me anytime during the live stream. Jack, yeah, polychylus, I have to say, are my favorites at the moment. Let me get a polychylus for you real fast. Hmm, which one should I show you? Okay. So, this is what we call a polychylus phalaenopsis. It doesn't have a flower just yet, but when it will bloom, it's going to be amazing. This is the Tetraspis C1. The polychylus subgenus of phalaenopsis, or subgroup of phalaenopsis, refers to the summer blooming phalaenopsis. If you know phals, you know they tend to bloom in spring. Yeah, these guys usually tend to bloom in summertime. They're not triggered by the lower temperatures. They bloom whenever it's nice and warm. So yeah, polychylus are my favorites at the moment. Karen, what is my medium for Phalaenopsis right now? Well, I have my typical bark and moss medium. Um, I try to grow them in many different types of medium, but I find that they do actually do quite a lot better in a sphagnum moss mixture for me because my climate is just so, so hot. But I have to say the Phalaenopsis are the most let's say forgiving of their medium. I had them in Lega, I had them in an organic, in ceramics, in many, many different things, and they do great. They're, they don't have sensitive roots at all. And I have a running joke throughout my YouTube channel. If you put an orchid, a Phalaenopsis, on the desk and you let it grow, it's probably going to grow. Billy, how do you repot orchids with roots growing out of the ventilation holes? Do you kill the roots? Well, it depends. That's a good question. I do get this question quite a lot. It is inevitable that roots will start to grow from the drainage holes or ventilation holes. No matter how fine or thin the slits are, they will find a way. And that is inevitable. So let me find one that it, it's already past the point of no return when it comes to aerial roots. 
hmm, let's just take the single O. So it is inevitable that at some point, oh no, she's okay. You will have roots growing out of these slits. When I repot them, typically I like to save the pot because I typically use plastic pots and I, I, I just don't want to waste them. I don't want to throw away plastic when I know I can absolutely reuse it. So if my orchid has a ton of roots, which Phalaenopsis usually have, oh, here we have one. See? And you see how thin the, the slits are. So what I do is try to slowly remove the root. It's not going to be possible all of the time. So yes, some of the roots will have to be sacrificed because I don't want to waste the plastic pot. I have plastic pots that lasted me seven years at this point. Um, so they can last a long time and it's just wasteful. So I'd rather just kill off roots at this point. But if my orchid does not have roots, if it's a sickly phalaenopsis and I want to preserve all of the roots, I will go ahead and definitely destroy the pot. No questions about it. As much as possible though, I try not to destroy the pot. Josie, it takes me three years to flower a Phalaenopsis. Is it normal? All the others are okay. It's not necessarily normal. Phalaenopsis orchids bloom once a year. And you might know at this point, if you don't, uh, check my channel out. The way to rebloom them, re them is to give them a uh, drop in temperature during autumn or winter, depending on your climate. So either your orchid didn't get that drop in temperature, either there's something else at play, but I doubt it. It's not normal. They should bloom every year. Hi, Andres. Glad you could join us. Robin, your Phalaenopsis are loving sphagnomoss and bark. But you have three Phalaenopsis mounted with sphagnum moss. That's great. Phalaenopsis definitely can be grown mounted because they are epiphytic orchids. And all epiphytic orchids can actually be grown mounted. Speaking about mounted Phalaenopsis, here is one that if I could, I would grow it mounted because it lends itself very well. This is Phalaenopsis schilleriana. This is a species and the cute thing about it can you see the roots? They are flat. They are not round like the other orchids. So I did notice with this one that it rather likes to create its roots flat on a surface than dig up in the medium into the sphagnum moss. Out of all of my phalaenopsis, this is one that mm, doesn't like sphagnum moss all that much, but I can get away with it in mostly bark which means I have to water it more frequent, but that's okay. So definitely Phalaenopsis can be grown mounted. Absolutely. If you have the availability to water, that's great. And if you can grow the Schilleriana mounted and even the Suartiana, that's even greater because they do lend themselves to that. They have the roots adapted to that. But of course, pots work as well. Hi, Lotus. Hi from Canada. Hi. Jack, can I show you guys my Phalaenopsis Bellina? Absolutely. Let's just grab her because I have her ready. Phalaenopsis Bellina is yet another polychylus type orchid. Here's a funny story, funny story with my Phalaenopsis Bellina. I purchased her four or five years ago. She had an issue. She had a lot of spider mites, which transmitted the orchid fleck virus, which appears as chlorosis spots all over the leaves. And for the longest time, she could not get rid of that virus. But I see that in recent times, maybe in the past two years or so, look at that foliage. It looks so great. This is my little angel. I love this Phalaenopsis so incredibly much. It is the Phalaenopsis that captivated me ever since I saw it eight years ago or something or seven years ago. I still have it. I just um, thought it would never get rid of the virus. And how I got, I got, she got rid of the virus was just treating her well. There's nothing that can cure a virus. I don't wanna like <laughs> make allusions to what's happening in the world right now, but yeah, the immune system of the orchid needs to fight it. And I think it looks terrific. She will bloom in the summer. So here she is, I love it. Sheila, thank you so much. Thank you, I'm happy you think that way. Um, pineapples, is it okay for the bottom leaves to drop? Absolutely. But let's just talk a little bit about that. I have an orchid which has a dropping leaf, which I would like to show you guys. So, oops, well, sadly the leaf fell. But the, um, 
bottom leaves, the bottommost leaves, typically fall once a year, once every two years, and it's absolutely fine. So this one that I managed to break right now, and I was very careful before the stream not to break, just broke. Um, but this is absolutely normal. If you can see the orchid, she looks absolutely fine. The roots are okay, leaves all are okay. If you have the two bottom leaves falling, most of the times it's normal regeneration. But if you have more than two leaves falling, or better yet, I have another one to show you. See, I'm prepared. So if you have something like this, and let's just take a closer look at it. Can you see that the leaves that fell are somewhere in the middle, but we still have the bottom leaves and the top leaves? This is not normal. This means something's happening. Luckily, in this case, it only means that the leaf was pierced by roots or flower spikes, and that can happen too. But when you see something like this, typically you need to think about stem rot. Thank you so much uh, for the super stream. What do you call them? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Macon. I really appreciate it. I'm really considering reporting my Phalaenopsis like you, like I did back in the day I started. Really want a Schilleriana, Ludemanniana, and Stuartiana. I actually have all three of them. But the uh, Ludemanniana is um, not blooming at the moment. Jane, thank you so much for the super chat. There we go. I figured out how it's called. Thank you so much. Thomas, thank you so much for the super chat. You're all so kind. Breed up. Do flower spikes stop growing in the spring? What will happen to them? Uh, on my Leodora, they stopped growing for a month now. Good question, Brita. Let's, go, let's just get the Leodora for a second. Uh, where did I put her? All right. So, the Leodoro is a hybrid. It's a special hybrid. I consider it a polychylus because it has the Phalaenopsis bellina in its parentage. Bellina and other Polychylus Phalaenopsis have continuous growing flower spikes, um, which means that um, year after year, they can start reblooming again from the tip. They will not create many, many blooms, as you can see with this one, but they will continue to produce uh, buds. So if your um, Leodoro stop growing her spikes, that's absolutely normal, she will grow she will start growing leaves, go into the vegetative growth mode, and then when winter or autumn comes, she will start to produce buds again because she has a different type of Phalaenopsis in her parentage. With the Bellina, which is her parent, it's not necessarily the same. It will continue the flower spike year after year, but it will only bloom in summertime. However, with typical Phalaenopsis, you can go ahead and cut the flower spike because most of the times they have a lot of Schilleriana or Stuartiana in their parentage, so they will not hang on to their flower spikes. They definitely can rebloom from the same flower spike. Um, they can go two years with the same flower spike. I personally prefer to cut the flower spike from the base because it just gives more energy to the plant to prepare a brand new flower spike next year. So that's me personally. So typically one year is the maximum time that a flower spike can remain, but it can go for longer than that. Josie, keep safe. Thank you so much. You keep safe as well. Jack, update on the sick bronze maiden. Well, the bronze maiden was never sick. She's around. She's not sick. What, ha what happened was the flowers and the buds dropped because I have a major thrips issue. Let's talk about the thrips because this is the bane of my existence this year. So, sadly, my big Phalaenopsis orchids have, most all of them, have been affected by thrips. And when I say that they, they have been affected, I don't mean that the foliage or the roots or anything of the sorts are affected. The flowers are affected. This one looks good but most of my big Phalaenopsis have all sorts of spots on their foliage and I go every day and try to catch the thrips. It's always a new thrip every day. So I am considering filming them, presenting them in the orchids in bloom at the end of the month and then cutting the flower spike and be done with it. Maybe keep them outside for a little bit just to have those natural predators uh, take care of whatever thrip I have left. But yeah, sadly this year my Phalaenopsis are very attacked and I don't want to keep them in the greenhouse anymore. I want to take them out. 
But yeah, speaking about the big phalaenopsis that I like, here is one that I can put up with because she has a big lip. This is not the best example. Here we go. So this is yet another type of hybrid that I saw in flower shops a lot this year and I love it. I love the big lip phalaenopsis. Um, but when it comes to simple big phalaenopsis, eh, you know, I prefer to have something like this. <laughs> Colin, have I tried scolding the thrips? I have. And not just me, the birds have as well. It, it's not working. So. Thomas, I'm so sorry to hear that you have thrips problems. I see a lot of people talking about thrips this year. I don't know, maybe, maybe the climate was in such a way that, or the, the weather changes were in such a way that many people have thrips issues. I don't know, it's the first time that I'm having thrips. Julie, is LED, does LED light can be used, or LED light, can it be used as a grow light? Hi from the Philippines, hi to you too, thank you for joining. Yes, absolutely. All of these that you see in the back here, they are LEDs, they're shop lights actually. I don't have in my greenhouse at the moment anything that is not an LED, so absolutely you can use them, it, it's actually better. Pineapples, thank you so much. I love them too, they're sleeping and they're quiet at the moment. Lucy, do you have thrips issues as well? Sorry to hear. Catherine, um, well, depends on my summers. If the summer is prolonged, then my polychylus will be in bloom until December. Um, if the summer starts to become rather wet, rather gloomy, they kind of stop growing or stop blooming somewhere in October, but it depends on the year. As long as it's very sunny and hot, they will be in bloom. Billy, yes, I do still use non-toxic insecticides for spider mites. Um, I use non-toxic means for anything. I have a fear of toxic insecticides. That's why I still have thrips issues. <laughs> so yeah. Jack, I don't know which one are you talking about. Can you be more specific? Boreal, it, it really depends on the keiki. Um, typically a keiki will form in about two or three months and then it will start to create leaves. But depending on the orchid you have, it can take, it can take afterwards up to two years until you will see a flower spike or a full, let's say, crown of leaves. So at the moment, I think you might know, let me, let me go ahead and get her that my Schilleriana is actually a keiki. What happened was the mother plant stopped growing. I don't think uh, I did something wrong, but definitely the crown was affected by something. So this is the keiki, and I have to say that within a year, the keiki grew like this. It created a flower spike, everything is okay, but it's not the case with everything. Um, I had a keiki which I saved three or four years ago at this point, it took three years only for it to become this size. So depending what you're dealing with, really, there's no set time. I discovered that for any orchid, there is no set time. RDR, I know green lace wigs, they do eat uh, the larvae. There are many beneficial insects um, that you can acquire and release in your grow space. The problem is there's nobody here offering them for sale. And if I were to order them from other places like um, Amazon from other countries, probably they will take a little bit too much on transport to arrive alive to me. So that is the problem. I have nothing against bugs. I love bugs. I have spiders around which I let be, but I cannot get my hands on green lace wigs or things of the sorts. Mylene, thank you so much. Thank you guys, you are so, so, so nice to me. Alma, currently I am using Leaf Shine. Yeah, I know, it's a little weird. A little side note before I get to the Leaf Shine. You saw my Bellina. This is not Leaf Shine, I did not treat the Bellina with anything. Polychylus phalaenopsis naturally have this beautiful shine on their leaf. So please do not start to use leaf shine to get these types of leaves. It's not okay to use it all the time. But speaking about leaf shine, 
I found one that is mineral oil based, paraffin oil based, and because it has such a good atomizer, I think it's called, I can deliver a fine and even mist um, on the leaves or wherever I spray it. So that's what I use for thrips because using my normal miticide, the one with water and baby oil or paraffin oil, it's a little tricky right now because it's still kind of cool outside, so I risk rotting. I'll show you something not so pleasant <laughs> later on. Um, so yeah, for now, that's what I use for thrips, but of course there are other methods, other means, everybody has a different method. And since we started to talk about the problem with using water in cold seasons, let me show you something that Phalaenopsis are really known for. So yeah, I know this doesn't look right. This is an orchid which has crown rot. Sadly, it is a variegated one, which pains my heart. This is the DTPS Sogo Vivian. What happened to this one was crown rot and I induced it. In the autumn, I sprayed all of my orchids with my miticide solution, which by all means works great, but the timing was wrong. After I sprayed them that exact night, temperatures went a little bit too low, Probably some water was still left in the crown and hey presto one month later All of this happened at the moment. I think I managed to stop it I will definitely lose this leaf as well But I'm hoping that it will be the last leaf because I need the stem to create some keikis It's not the only thing that I did. I managed to break the flower spike. But that's a different story um, so that can happen and that is my issue with using anything that involves water at the wrong time. So one of the very big reasons why I'm using Leaf Shine right now is that it does not contain any water. It's just alcohol and oil. Alcohol evaporates super fast. Oil doesn't promote pathogens at all. It actually is not a good medium for them. So that's why I use it right now, but I use it very carefully. Two, you have a filter that removes fluoride, that is great. I actually heard that here in my part of the world, world, I don't have fluoride in the water, so I don't have to treat it in any way, but I did hear that in many, many regions of the world you have fluoride. I would suggest you remove it if you can. What about my variegated Amabilis LC? I still have it, it's on the shelf somewhere there. It decided not to bloom for me this year, I don't know why. It's still kind of a seedling if you think about it. It's like this. So maybe that's why I didn't bloom, but I have it. Larissa, are white bugs moving clearly on the soil dangerous? No. And actually, if you search my channel for a pretty recent video, I think I posted it a month ago, you will see a video with a digital microscope taking a look at the soil mites. What you are seeing are most probably springtails, which are very, very beneficial. They eat tiny little molds in the medium. They don't touch the roots. They're absolutely fine. You don't need to get rid of them. Don't worry about them. Michelle, hi. My Phalaenopsis have lost their roots in the bark, but still have their aerial roots. I watered when their roots in the pot were silvery. Any idea what I did wrong? It really depends on the history of the orchid. Um, many of the times, Phalaenopsis go through a sort of transplant shock. So if your orchid was potted in a much wetter medium, like sphagnum moss or a combination, or even degraded bark, when you switched it to fresh bark, which is very airy and very dry, it might have gotten a little bit of a shock. And the older roots did not adapt and they died off. So I'm guessing that's what happened. If the aerial roots are fine, that's great because you can hydrate the orchid through the aerial roots. But I would suggest that if you have an orchid with an orchid which you want to switch to a completely different medium, to try to ease it. Again, if you search my, I wish I could like link videos right now on the screen, but I can't. Um, if you search my archive, you will see some videos that talk about easing orchids or transitioning orchids into new medium or avoiding transplant shock. So you'll see more there. What leaf shine do you use or do you make your own solution? I have my own solution, which you can find if you search get rid of spider mites at home and then Miss Orchid Girl. But I'm using, I don't know, it's a normal, I don't know if it's a brand, it's a, something that I find in flower shops 
but what's important is that you use one with paraffin oil. There are some leaf shines with wax, you don't want those. Update on the sick phalaenopsis, which use, I used in 10 tips to recover orchids. I think the name is Bronze Maiden. <laughs> Bronze Maiden um, is still not recovered. I know which one you're talking about. I don't have roots yet. Here's another thing. Usually phalaenopsis, they will create roots readily and you don't necessarily need to do anything, but there are some of them which will just not root. Typically when that happens, it means that the orchid has an issue. Very rarely you will find a perfectly healthy Phalaenopsis which refuses to create roots because they are continuous growers. So when they lose their roots in a month or two, they should have roots. If they don't have roots, there's something wrong with the orchid, sadly. And let's just get another orchid to look at something pretty, shall we? Let's get the Leodoro. Andy, about Fusarium, you're saying that you currently have some outside orchids. You suspect them that they have Fusarium. Um, are there any non-invasive non-invasive ways of finding out if your orchid has Fusarium? Not for sure. You can make an educated guess. If your orchid starts to have all sorts of deficiencies without any reason, uh, then it might be Fusarium. If your orchid starts to have all sorts of chlorotic spots, I think with Phalaenopsis actually there is a sign when you have chlorotic spots on the flower spikes, theoretically that's a sign of Fusarium. However, I don't think all of these signs are very, very reliable, particularly on Phalaenopsis, which don't have rhizomes. So you can make a guess, but I don't know if you can tell for sure. Carely Taps, any tips for seedlings? That is a very good question. Phalaenopsis seedlings, I find, are not different than their mature counterparts, I would say, not very different. You might note that I have some Cattleya seedlings. Those guys are super different from their mature versions. They need a lot more watering, a lot more babying. Phalaenopsis, not so much. Um, as I was saying, I have a seedling, a, um, an Amobilis, which is a seedling does absolutely fine. Uh, my Shilariana is a seedling, if you can consider it a seedling, although she's a keiki, absolutely fine. It doesn't matter. I've never deflexed one, but seedlings are exactly like their mature counterparts. Kia, what European nursery would I recommend for Phalaenopsis? Oh, Orchids Deluxe. Yeah. I would go for Orchids Deluxe in Netherlands. And this is not like sponsored and I don't have an affiliation with them at all. But in my experience, they're the only nursery that specializes mainly on Phalaenopsis and particularly on Polykylus and these special hybrids. You'll not probably find miniature Phalaenopsis, but all sorts of other very special orchids, you'll find them there. I, I cannot wait to order <laughs> again. I'm going through withdrawal. You're welcome, Kia. Andrea, I'm glad to help. If you find this um, useful, my job is done. What medium do I use for seedlings? Exactly the same as for adults. I use a combination of bark and moss. You cannot see the moss, but it's there. If you find that your seedlings, because they're potted in a smaller pot, they dry out too fast, just put more moss in there. They're absolutely okay with moss. Britta, you repotted your Phalaenopsis to mostly bark. You're, but you're a little afraid to add sphagnum moss because it degrades faster. Let me tell you a secret. I don't know why articles say that sphagnum moss degrades faster. I really don't. I will tell you that my best grow sphagnum moss degrades much slower than this bark. This is not orchiara, it's just fir bark that I find locally. It's not the best quality bark, I get it, but in my experience sphagnum moss lasts longer than that. Can you believe it? So if you have best grow, don't worry about it. As long as it doesn't have algae. If it has algae, it's done. Well, Angelo, um, the only trick the flower shop, the standard flower shop phal phalaenopsis need to rebloom is the lowering temperature thing in autumn. Do check out my channel, search my channel for how to make Phalaenopsis rebloom or actually visit the link in the description. I have my whole uh, care series for beginners. There is an episode which talks about reblooming. 
um, and I talk at length there. Basically, the bottom line is these orchids need a drop in temperature at some point during the year to signal them that, hey, summer is over, stop growing leaves, start growing flower spikes. Many, many people don't get blooms because of that, not because they don't care for their orchid properly. Tristan, you can absolutely use live sphagnum moss with orchids, epiphytic orchids that is. You can consider epiphytic orchids air dwellers, which means whatever you can attach them to to provide moisture is great. If you want to attach them, this will sound stupid, to your bathroom towel, that's great. It's gonna work, I assure you. Um, it's not going to be very functional, <laughs> but you can attach them. So definitely whatever you can think of which is not toxic to the roots, you can use. Brit, I know, right? <laughs> I know, I cannot wait to order orchids again. But hey, let's just take this as an opportunity to... It's not funny, Maya. Take this as an opportunity to gather our thoughts. And, and Maya knows that I don't take the opportunity to gather my thoughts. And think of what we want with our collection. Orchids are nice and all, but it is really important kind of to take a step back, step back from time to time and assess our collection. Do we really want this or we just bought it because we saw a video or we saw somebody talking about it, you know? It's good to do that and that's why at the moment I think I will get rid of some of my big phalaenopsis. Marsha, absolutely, you can mount orchids on your wooden fence, on your tree, as long as it's not a toxic tree, you can do all of that. Just make sure that your climate is right because most of the times what gets them is the chill in winter. These are kind of worm growing, not only the polychylus, but the flower shop ones as well. So if your winter gets very, very chilly, don't mount it on the, bar, on the tree because you will have to unmount it in the winter and you're gonna break the roots. Aman, how do you cultivate live sphagnum moss? Check out my channel again, search for it. You can actually make it sprout. The best grow moss that I have, not the compressed one, not the eight liters one, the big um, bags, they're not heat treated. So they have spores of moss within them. So if you keep them wet all of the time, you'll have moss just starting to sprout. It's harder to keep it alive though. Tracy, I don't think north windows are enough. You can try it though. Maybe you have, let's say, white or light colored buildings in front of your window. You, you can work with those because the life will be reflected. But typically north, north facing windows, they're not very, very good for any orchid, not even for Phalaenopsis, but it really depends. Try it though. I would go for east windows. Larissa, thank you so much. I'm so happy <laughs> to hear that. The most rewarding thing that you can tell me is, hey, my orchid is alive and I managed to keep it alive or bloom it, and it was because of your video. Thank you so much. That's the goal. Thank you, Kala. Lucy, <laughs> my sense of humor can get dark sometimes. I'm trying to pipe it down. Allison, there you go. Yeah, south-facing windows can work as well. You just need to shelter a little bit the foliage from the sun, but south windows are the best. And also, Cassandra, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Catherine, mm, that's a very good question. So, if the light where you keep your orchid is always on, that can pose a lot of issues for orchids generally. Orchids, just like us and anything alive, they are adapted to having a day and a night. And this affects them in a very complex way. Most, I mean, all plants, including orchids, are adapted to do certain activities during the day and certain activities during the night. In the case of plants and orchids in general, what they do in the day um, is take up all of that sun and photosynthesize and at night open up their stomatas and release um, oxygen. So, uh, sorry, CO2. And during the day, release oxygen. So if you do not, do not provide this day and night difference, they will not breathe correctly. And that can lead to a lot of issues actually. So yeah, they do need a day and a night. Alison, thank you so much, you're so sweet. 
I hope nobody is giving you a hard time about it, really. <laughs> I know how some people can get, so. Jenny, you are rehabbing your orchid with only a few roots. How can you help it get leaves for photosynthesis? Just let it do its thing. One of the things that I believe we're a little exaggerating with are all sorts of magic potions, I like to call them, or magic things to try to make them root, try to make them create leaves, try to do this and that. I think at some point they can do more harm than good. You cannot make an orchid create roots if it doesn't have the energy to do so. You cannot make an orchid create big leaves if it doesn't have the root system to sustain them, sustain them and also the energy stored for them. So the best, best thing you can do is baby it. Don't put it through extremes. Don't put it in the sunshine. Don't keep it in the cold or in the heat. Just let it do its thing in the best possible environment you can provide. And that's the best thing you can do for orchids. Oh, goodbye, Jack. Have a good night. Sleep tight. Thank you so much for joining us today. Amy, thank you. I'm, I'm happy if my videos helped. Really happy. Vanetta, yeah, it's absolutely okay to use hydrogen or liqua with orchids. Ho mm, coco okay, coconut husk. If you're having issues with coconut husk, try to see if the brand you're using is a good brand or it's suitable for orchids because what coconut husk can have sometimes is salt. Coconut trees grow on the beach. There's a lot of salt in the air and all around. And typically with coconut husk, if you don't do a good desalting of the product, you're gonna have a lot of issues with the roots. They will stop growing, they will get dark patches. I had them in the past um, and it's just not going to be a good time. So yeah, definitely either switch the brand or go to something else. Try bark, sphagnum moss, even charcoal if you have this available in your country. It's all good. Coconut husk, I know, it can be an issue. I had issues with it as well. Let's switch the orchid. Oh, by the way, I wanna ask you guys something. How do you feel about white orchids? Do you like them? You don't like this much? Let me know. I like them. Courtney, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope you're not actually making people a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> But thank you, I really appreciate you sharing my videos. <laughs> Is it okay to put Spanish moss on orchids for hydration, Johnny? Good question. Maybe. I would say not so much. I have experience with Spanish moss. Again, if you search my history, um, Brad here on YouTube, he used to put Spanish moss, which is a plant, it's a, an air plant called Tillandsia. He used to put moss on um, Xander roots and it looked spectacular and one day I got myself a whole bunch of Spanish moss just out of a fluke from a flower shop put it on the Xander roots thinking that it will keep moisture in and you know what it did it absorbed moisture because air plants are very absorbent their leaves are actually what absorbs water since they don't have roots so what happened was I had to water my Vanda a lot more frequent because of the Spanish moss so I don't know if it will provide more moisture to your orchid, but definitely will look nice. <laughs> Jessica, yeah, I know, I love them too. I know, Ryan. I think so too, they're very classy. I find that monochromatic sometimes, or colors which are more subdued are just so much classier. White and also the black orchid that I have, it's not a Phalaenopsis. I just find them so elegant. You know what my dream orchid is? Red and black. I don't think it will ever be created, but can you imagine? Jesse, I'm really happy. I actually have viewers telling me that they don't actually have orchids, but they just like to watch videos. And I can so relate to that because there are many channels, including Laura from Garden Answer, which just make me so calm and I just love watching even though I don't have a garden. I'm thinking maybe one day I will, but yeah, I'm happy that my videos are that for you. RDR, that can work as well. An automated spraying system, that's great. 
I wanted to do something like that last summer for the Vandas, a little side note. You can do it very, very easily if you get a hose and you make some holes, poof, automated, semi-automated or manual misting system. Marsha, I never heard of that orchid, monkey's throat. I've never heard of that. Is it a Phalaenopsis? Vedrana, should I separate basil cakey growing from the base of mother plant? Mother plant is self-killer. What do you mean by that? You can absolutely separate the cakey, but be sure that the basil cakey has roots. The same rules as with spike cakeys apply. If the cakey doesn't have roots, if you separate it, it's probably not going to make it. But if there's something wrong with the orchid, absolutely, you can separate it. This was the case with my Schilleriana. Let's see if I can actually show you here. Well, you can't really see it, but right here is a stump that belonged to the mother plant. I did not remove it because there were roots there, and if I removed the cakey, I might have damaged the stem. Um, so in this case, the mother plant simply withered off, but definitely you can remove it if it has roots. If it doesn't have roots, do not remove it. Even though they don't have a rhizome, the stems communicate, so the keiki still benefits from the roots of the mother plant. Um, so see what the case is. You can definitely let them be. They can live together without any type of issue as well. Yeah, Angelo, it's a witchcraft. It's the Catacetum Moniorara Miladium Magic Witchcraft. I still have it. It's, it didn't bloom in a long time. Oh, Marsha, Bucket Orchid. Oh, I love it. It's on my wish list as well. Let me give you a little tip on the Bucket Orchid. It's almost the end of the stream, so we can talk a little bit about other orchids as well. The Bucket Orchid, I saw um, a seminar on the American Orchid Society on the membership area, so not open to the public. They were saying that the Corianthus in its natural habitat lives together with some sort of ants, which produce a, a sort of acid. So the best results with the Corianthus is with a very acidic medium. Um, the best growth sphagnum moss that I have goes into the 4.5 pH. So I think that's a good medium to use with it. If you have issues, if you don't have issues with it, obviously <laughs> don't. But if you are thinking of using Leca, mm, I wouldn't go with Leca with these orchids. But yeah, I would keep these orchids very, very acidic. Also, speaking about that, um, the uh, Stanhopia and also the Gongora are related to the Corianthus and I'm trying to keep them in moss mainly and they're doing fantastic. The Stanhopia did fantastic. Speaking about members, I just remembered. Uh, if you are my YouTube member this week, or it's Sunday today, next week I will make a live voice chat on Discord and I hope you will all participate. We can like directly talk if you want. So um, I'm not sure about the day, but yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know that I will make it. So if you don't have Discord, but you're a member, do consider getting Discord. Um, and if you're not a member, do consider becoming a member. You have the links down below. And yeah, you guys, I think we're almost done. Uh, but one last thought about Phalaenopsis orchid, orchids. I know we kind of make fun of them. I know some of us call them peasants orchids and stuff like that, but we have to give them credit for something. I think most of us, us have been inspired by them to go into this wonderful orchid journey. So even though, yeah, they have their quirks and yeah, they're big, they look like lettuces when they're not in bloom, they can also look very, very beautiful and even the white and pink and purple ones at the flower shops, they are creating new passionate people every single day. Can you imagine that? And I see them on my channel every single day. I have new people, new subscribers, mostly beginners. And that's because of the Phalaenopsis orchid, because of this little creature here. And from here on, I like to believe that the orchid hobby will inspire more than just collecting a few orchids. I'm hoping that the hobby itself will inspire more respect towards nature, more, let's say, more curiosity when it comes to the natural world and what we can do to protect it and just respecting it in general. Um, because when I was a kid, I remember 
things were not as they are today. I'm happy to see that today we do pay a lot more attention to what's around us. But I do remember there was a time when we didn't really do that all that much. And I like to believe that orchids have something to do with it because if you can imagine, there are they are the I do believe they are among the best-selling plants in flower shops and garden centers after probably your typical house plants. So for that, I am really thankful for them and uh, for you guys and for Amy who just became a member. Thank you so so much. Um, do check out Discord as well. Um, and. Yeah, I really, really hope that Phalaenopsis will make a sort of comeback in the, let's say, more expert, not expert, more advanced growers out there because yes, beginners have them a lot. But you know, as the years go by, you just get a little bit bored of them. Well, I hope that I will give you reasons not to get bored of them. As I was saying, my passion for the Polychylus genus is getting overwhelmingly high right now and it will only get better. Um, so yeah, with that said, I hope you guys enjoyed today's live stream. I hope you had a great time. I will do live streams every Sunday. That will be uh, my schedule, hopefully. <laughs> I can keep up to it. And you guys should let me know if you have suggestions for future episodes, future streams. You can leave me a comment on my videos, on my community page, wherever you want, on Discord. That would be great. Now that said, I really, really wish you guys a lot of health, have a great time, have a great Easter if you're celebrating, and yeah, just be with your loved ones and with these beautiful creatures that brought us all together here. So with that said, you know the drill? <laughs> I don't know what the drill is because it's not a video, but yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Have fun with your orchids and stay safe. Bye!